<clears throat> For those who are watching, we just sang the song I Can Only Imagine. It talks about being in the presence of the Lord and I want to try and set a little bit of the stage here this morning for uh, the message. As we were singing that song, I was reminded that when God had them build the tabernacle and then later the temple, the Holy of Holies was designed that the whole inner walls were gold. They were panels overlaid with gold, so you had a room that had gold walls. So you think of just how shiny that would be, and then you add the Shekinah glory of God into that place. So imagine a room enclosed with gold walls, reflective, and then the glory of God comes in. Imagine the brilliance. So when they finished the tabernacle, and later in Solomon's day when they finished the temple, it said the priests could not serve all they could do is bow down because of the brightness of God's glory. So to set the stage of where we are here in Matthew, I'm going to return a little bit to Leviticus again because it's the Day of Atonement and it comes into play as to what's been happening with Jesus here at the end of the book of Matthew. I want to remind us that on the Day of Atonement, one day out of the year, the high priest would take the blood of a sacrifice and enter into that most holy place. Gold walls, glory of God. Hebrews tells us that God's presence is a all-consuming fire. Again, just to get an idea of what the high priest is stepping into when he goes through that curtain into the most holy place. You are stepping into the presence of God. You are stepping into the, the brilliance of his glory. When Paul had his encounter on the Damascus Road, he says it was noontime. This past week has been a pretty good evidence of the power of the sun at noontime. And Paul says, but I encountered a light that was brighter than the noonday sun. And all I could do was fall on my face to try and escape the power of its glory. So we're talking about a very important day, a very important moment. And it's easy to look at the high priest and think, oh man, look at where he is on the pinnacle of being able to go in there. I want us to look at that view Point from a little bit different perspective. Let's read a little bit here out of uh, Exodus first, page one of the notes. Exodus 28, when God was giving Moses the plans for the tabernacle and the garments for the priesthood, he says this, Exodus 28, verse 39. You shall skillfully weave the tunic of fine linen, and you shall make the turban of fine linen, and you shall make the sash of woven work. V verse 43. They shall be on Aaron and his, on his sons when they come into the tabernacle of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place that they do not incur iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever to him and his descendants after him. Now, we've been talking about some of this past couple of weeks. Revelation 19 indicates that the fine linen garments are righteous acts. That nakedness in the scriptures was a symbol of sin or of filthy garments. And the white clean fine linen is a symbol of righteousness. So let's find out what's happening here. God says to Moses, I want you to make certain garments made out of fine clean linen that's for the priests that when they enter into the tabernacle, and in particular, a one set of garments for the high priest on the day that he goes behind the curtain into the Holy of Holies. And he says they must be on him, lest he incur iniquity and die. So again, imagine that you're of the family of Aaron, a descendant of Aaron, and you have been selected 
to be the high priest for the year, and it's now the Day of Atonement. And it's going to be your job to go into the tabernacle by yourself, do everything correctly, including putting on the garments that indicate righteousness. So it's not just fine linen thread. It has to do with the fact that when you come into the God's presence, you come in as a righteous person. In other words, you have to do everything the way God wants it done. That's righteousness. Doing what God says he wants done. Just putting on those garments is an act of righteousness, an act of obedience. So you're going to go through all of these steps of killing the animal, collecting his blood, preparing to go behind the curtain into the golden-walled, glory-filled presence of God. And you're carrying a sacrifice that's going to atone for your sins, the sins of your family, and the sins of the nation of Israel. If you do it all right. If you do it correctly. If you don't do it correctly, you're not coming out of the tabernacle on your own. Again, remember, Aaron had a number of sons. Two of them were Nadab and Abihu. And after God had given all the stipulations and said, these are the particular buckets you use for fire, Nadab and Abihu grabbed their own bucket, threw fire in it, and went running in there, and they were consumed. They died. So, it's an issue of not only being concerned about your own well-being, if you're the high priest, but the sins of the nation hang in the balance. based on what you do. Last week we talked about the Sabbath, and the Sabbath not just being a day, the Sabbath was a lifestyle. It was a lifestyle of walking in loving submission to God, walking with God. Sabbath is about finding my rest in what God has done and simply walking with him and doing what God tells me to do. That's Sabbath. We also call it righteousness. It's amazing how many words are connected. This Jesus did perfectly. He walked with his father. He was fully obedient, even including going to the cross and suffering and death. Jesus did everything perfectly. Now, why is that important? Because Jesus, according to the scriptures, isn't going into the earthly created temple. Scriptures say that that was copies of the authentic. The tabernacle and later the temple were simply copies. They were picture representations of what heaven is truly like. So when God gave them the plans, he says, here's the closest that you can get to representing my glory. Here's the closest you can get to what it's like to be in the throne room. Golden walls, reflective, and my glory coming in, and whatever brilliance that creates, that's the closest you can get to imagining what it's like to be in my presence. So Aaron and his descendants had the function of entering into that place, carrying the blood of the sacrifice for the sins of the nation. The writer of Hebrews says, but Jesus didn't go into the copy. Jesus went into the authentic. Now again, let's do some imagination. You're the high priest. You're going to be entering behind the curtain. You've got to do it all right. Or you're not coming out. 
Again, remember, one of the things that God had them do was to put bells on the bottom of the robes. So that as they moved around in there, everybody outside would know they're still alive. If the bells quit, <laughs> who's going to come get you? <laughs> Let's draw straws. Who go gets them? But not only that, if they die in there, all of our sins are not forgiven. The atonement doesn't work. Imagine being the high priest in here alone. No one else to direct you and what you have to know what to do. There's no one there to read through the list. You're by yourself. That's what the scripture says. On the day of atonement, you're alone. And you've done all of the things you've taken off the garments you had on, you've washed, you've put on the fine linen garments that are representation of righteousness. And now you're going to be obedient and you're going to step th past the curtain into the glory of God. What would you be thinking I mean, hopefully, our thoughts are on the sins of the nation and recognizing the responsibility that we're carrying. But as mortal people, at least we would be thinking about our own self-existence. <laughs> if I don't do it right, I'm not leaving that room by my own accord. How much more would we consider the righteousness of Jesus to be? To not enter the copy of heaven, but into heaven itself. How much more powerful, I'll say, how much more consuming is the fire of God in his actual presence? So Jesus takes his blood and steps before the Father in heaven. How much more perfect in obedience and righteousness did Jesus have to be? Sorry, I'm talking through a whole bunch of stuff here. So in the process, the high priest would come in, present the blood on the mercy seat, and if he's still alive, it means it's been accepted. That's a good thing. Then he would come back out and he would take off those garments, wash himself, put on other garments, and then come out and continue the ministry. And then eventually he would come all the way out so that everybody standing outside would see him standing here alive. That was the evidence to them. That was the proclamation to them that the blood was accepted and they've been forgiven. So on the day after the Sabbath, Mary and some others go to the tomb of Jesus and they find the stone rolled away. And the angel says, why are you looking for Jesus? He's not here. He has risen, as he said. And the angel says, go tell the disciples. He'll meet them in Galilee. And they start to move away from the tomb and they encounter Jesus. Alive. And then there's two on the road to Damascus. And Jesus encounters them as they're walking along the way. And then Jesus enters the room where the twelve are gathered. And they see the risen Jesus. And then Paul says there were over 500 people who saw him at one time. And then Paul says, as one born out of time, I saw him. In other words, there were multiple occasions in which the mass masses saw Jesus alive. The significance of that is Jesus went in before the glory of God. 
carrying his blood. You say, but he died. Oh, understand. Jesus occupies a whole bunch of different positions in the play. Jesus dies because he's the sacrifice. Not because he's the high priest. He dies because he's the sacrifice. And while he's in the tomb, he takes his blood before the Father in his fullness of glory. And when he comes out of the tomb and presents himself alive, now he's saying as the high priest, the blood's been accepted. And the evidence is, I'm alive. You've seen me. Everybody with me? So yeah, we just talked about through a whole bunch of stuff here on the notes. Sorry. <laughs> Jesus presenting himself alive is the signal that the blood was accepted. Now there's another part to that. Remember, the high priest comes in, offers the blood, comes out from behind the curtain, takes off the priestly garments, washes and puts on other garments and comes out. According to John, Peter and John run to the tomb when they hear that Jesus isn't there and they see the garments that he had been wrapped in lying there. You see it lines up. The garments that he had been wrapped in representing the high priest had been left behind. And now Jesus was alive wearing other stuff. He is our high priest. There's another message in this account. I'm over on page three of the notes, by the way. There's another message in this account. It's an oddity. It's easy to overlook it. But it's connected to everything that's happening. And there's a reason that God has given it to the Israelites and to us. Galatians 3 on page 3, beginning at verse 22, says this. But the scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came... We were kept under guard by the law, kept for faith, which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. Now, let's make some sense out of this. The Mosaic Law, and in particular, the sacrificial system including the Day of Atonement, were all teaching lessons to help the Jews and to help us understand who the Messiah is and what the Messiah accomplishes. They were showing us things, teaching us things. We've been spending a couple weeks now going through Leviticus 16 and connecting that Day of Atonement process to Jesus, his death on the cross, his burial in the tomb, being wrapped in the garments, and all of those things. The reason we understand Jesus as the high priest and what he was doing is because what Leviticus 16 tells us and what the nation of Israel did on a year-by-year-by-year-by-year-by-year basis. It was all teaching and instructions. Yes, here's what you're doing now, but this is pointing us. It's a tutor telling me about something else that's coming. And the reason that Matthew uses so much of that information in his writing is because he's trying to get the Jews to understand this Jesus is the Messiah. And we know it because if you watch what he has done, if you look at the steps, if you look at the details, they prove that Jesus is the Messiah. They prove that he was our high priest. They prove that he was the ultimate sacrifice. And because he comes out of the tomb, it proves that what he has done purchased our salvation. 
But there's another teaching here. I want to begin to look at it here. Page three of the notes, about right in the middle. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 9. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. Say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, and reap its harvest then. Now, this conversation has taken place on Mount Sinai. Remember, they spent 40 years in the wilderness because they refused to obey God and enter the land. This conversation has occurred way back to the beginning, shortly after they come out of Exodus. And God gives them some stipulations not to do while they're getting to the promised land, but there are certain stipulations that God has for them to accomplish when they get into the promised land. When they're experiencing God's faithfulness, when they're experiencing God's blessings that he told them he would bless them with, then God says, here's some things I want you to do. So in Leviticus 23, he says, when you enter the land and you reap its harvest, I want you to do something. Now, the grain harvest were the first things to come into fruition in the land. The barley and the wheat were the first harvest of the year. So when the grain harvest is about ready to be reaped, God says, I want you to go out into the harvest field and I want you to get a sheaf of grain and I want you to bring it to the priest. And the priest is going to take that single sheaf and he's going to come into my presence and he's going to hold it up and say, God, this belongs to you. He's going to do a wave offering. This is yours, Lord. Now, there's a reason. There's, there's aspects to this that are very, very important. First and foremost, sorry, this isn't in your notes. First and foremost, in Deuteronomy 7, God says to the nation, I didn't choose you because of your great size. I didn't choose you because you were the most powerful nation in the earth. I chose you, one, because you're the smallest, but I chose you because I love you. Don't miss that. God says to the nation of Israel, I chose you because I love you. And I've made you promises. And one of those promises is I'm going to bring you into this particular parcel of territory and I'm giving it to you. And I will bless you there. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, the very next chapter, God says to the nation, when you come into the land and you begin to experience all of the things that I'm going to bless you with, don't forget me. Don't forget that I'm the one who has given you all these blessings. So part of the process of helping them to remember God in the midst of blessing is to go out into the harvest field, get a sheaf of grain, Take it to the priest. The priest comes into the, into the tabernacle and he holds it up and he says, God, this is yours because it came from you. It's to help them keep their eyes focused on the one who has blessed them. But God says this, when you do that with that single sheaf, God says, I accept you. It's an interesting picture, and I've wrestled with this for a long time as to what really is happening here. He says, I'll accept that single sheaf on your behalf. What he's saying is that single sheaf represents all of the harvest. It's not the whole harvest. It simply is a representation of it. But he says, if you will honor me with that single one, then I'll accept that as if you've offered me the whole harvest. In other words, by saying, God, here's a single sheaf, and we acknowledge that it came from you. God says, I will receive that as praise. Praise. 
because it's coming from the heart that acknowledges the rest of the harvest also came from me. See, God says, you don't have to bring me the whole harvest. Just bring me one sheaf. Because I'll understand the heart that brought it. Everybody with me? Now, in Joseph's dream, when the sheaves bowed down to his sheaf, his family understood that the sheaves represented them as people. That Joseph was saying, my family members are going to bow down to me. Psalm 126, uh, page four of the notes, sorry. Page four of the notes, Psalm 126. I want to read through this part to try and help us see what's going on here. Psalm 126. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. This is one of the song of ascents. Uh, it's songs that the nation would sing when they were going towards Jerusalem for the, different, the three different festivals that God said you come here. The song of ascents, it's ascents because to get to Jerusalem you have to go up the mountain to get there. So you're ascending the mountain. It was to help fix their eyes on God so that when they get there they will truly worship him. By the way, it's one of the reasons that most churches, including ours, sings songs before we get to the message. To help focus our eyes upon him, our hearts upon him. Verse 4, bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Now the context of the song is about God bringing the wayward people back. Redemption. Restoration. And verse 6 simply talks about a sower who goes out sowing with tears. He's casting seed upon the ground, but when he comes back, he'll reap a harvest with singing. Again, he's actually talking about people. And the message really is about the work that Jesus does. He comes the first time sowing seed. But he's coming the second time for a harvest. Now, Jesus coming out of the tomb, there's two aspects of this. One, coming out of the tomb, the resurrection, and his ascension, is Jesus being that single sheaf. that's being presented before the Father as the very first fruit of the harvest. And God had said, if you acknowledge me with the first fruit, I'll accept the rest of the harvest as coming from a heart of gratitude. So Jesus, in his resurrection, is the single sheaf being held before the Father. And if the Father accepts the single sheaf, he says, I'll accept the rest of the harvest. So how does that come into play? Um, look at the uh, bottom of page four, Ephesians 1. God having predestined us to adoption as sons, by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. That line, made us accepted in the beloved, is the connection to the sheaf being received out of the harvest. That Jesus is the first fruit being presented to the Father, and the father looks at that sheaf and says, I accept that sheaf. 
And because I accept that sheaf, he says, I'll accept the rest of the harvest. You and I. He made us accepted in the beloved. Yes, I've been wrestling for the right words to communicate this, so if you're not getting it, I'll try and do better. It's an amazing thing that's happening here. Because in the same idea of the high priest needing to do everything perfectly to bring the atonement in before the Father for the acceptance of the nation, for the forgiveness of the nation, for the welcoming of the nation into his household as righteous. So Jesus is the high priest who went in before the presence of the Father and the work that he did there was fully accepted. And because of that work being accepted, then you and I can be accepted into God's household as righteous. By accepting the single sheaf, the work of the high priest, so God accepts the harvest, which is us. Bottom of page four of the notes, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as, Adam, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Paul, in referring to Jesus as the first fruits, is identifying him as the sheaf that's presented to the Father as the representation of the coming harvest. Now, here are some interesting aspects that I think about it. Page five of the notes it's a sampling of the coming harvest. Jesus was a righteous son walking with his father. And if he's representing the harvest, then Jesus is representing righteous children walking with God their father. That's why Paul writes to the Ephesians, says he's adopted us as sons. He's made us family. He's restored us in relationship so that we, like the single sheaf, can walk in righteousness, walk in obedience with our Father. That's why, again, Paul writes in Romans 8, verse 29. See, all of these things that these guys are writing, they're drawing upon what they know from their own history, from the Mosaic Law. They're using those ideas in the text. So here's Romans 8, verse 29. For whom he foreknew... He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You see, it's not just receiving the harvest. The idea of the sheaf being the representation of the harvest is sending a message of God says, I'm going to transform the harvest, us. He's, I'm going to transform you and make you like my son. The son who walked into my presence of consuming fire and glory. That son who stepped into my presence and did not die. But as a matter of fact, I raised him from the dead to prove that I accepted him. I'm going to transform you to be like him. Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Again, the idea behind what Paul's writing here is about that single sheaf. And if the sheaf is accepted, then the harvest is accepted. So what's he say? That, he, that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Because God accepted him. We get to be blessed spiritually. 
just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoptions as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. You see, God says in accepting the blood of Jesus is accepting the sheaf that represents the harvest. But the work that Jesus did is much more powerful than all the activity that was done in the earthly tabernacle or temple because it's based on better promises. And those promises in Christ is how to transform the harvest. I'm coming to bring a harvest to me. They're going to look like my son. I forgive them. I cleanse them. But I'm also going to train them now in righteousness by the presence of the Spirit. And the psalmist says, the sower who went out to sow is going to bring his harvest with him. Hebrews 2, verse 10, again, page 5 of the notes. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things, by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. Verse 13, and again, I'll put my trust in him, and again, here I am and the children whom God has given me. The high priest going into the presence of God is there on behalf of the nation. And in essence, the high priest is saying, I am here. to ask you to accept what I am doing for the forgiveness of the nation. You see, the high priest and the sheaf are very, very similar in what they're doing, what they represent. So Jesus goes before the Father and says, I am here to present myself as an offering to you for the acceptance of the rest of the harvest. And his resurrection, symbolic of the sheaf being waved before the Father, is a further testimony that God has accepted him. And because God has accepted him, God says, I accept the coming harvest. Now here's the one thing we have to keep in mind. The issue at hand in all of that, whether it was the Day of Atonement, whether it was simply daily sacrifices, whether it's the bringing of the sheaf to the priest, whatever the activity was, the heart of the people had to be engaged to recognize God. All of the steps, none of that matters if the concentration of the heart of gratitude and thanksgiving isn't on God. That was the purpose behind it all. And what I've been hearing the Lord say to me is we must constantly just be in awareness of the love of God and his salvation for us. To be someone who's watching Jesus as the high priest go into the Father's presence on my behalf. Jesus didn't have to go there for his sin. He went there for my sin. And to be eternally grateful that he was willing to enter into the presence of God, something I couldn't do. I would have been consumed. But he went into the Father's presence on my behalf. And the message that God keeps speaking to me is about 
that one servant that when Jesus tells the story and says he was forgiven his debt, but then he went out and began to chastise a servant who owed him money. And God is making the point of saying, how can you treat other people so poorly when you are the one who've been forgiven? And the message that I keep hearing from all of this is, if my heart attitude towards God is proper in understanding his love and what he has done for my salvation, then that remembrance should be the compelling background of my grace and ministry to other people, to forgive them, to help them, to care for them, to love them. Not simply because it's a duty, but to be born out of a gratitude for what God has done for me. That's where, for the Old Testament in particular, the Sabbath came into play. You see, on the Day of Atonement, that was a Sabbath day. And God says, you shall do no work on that day. In other words, deny self wanting to do something and recognize there is nothing that self can do. My forgiveness on the Day of Atonement, my forgiveness was dependent upon what the high priest was doing, not what I'm doing. It doesn't matter what I put in the offering plate. It doesn't matter anything else. It all has to do with what the high priest is doing. So my forgiveness, my understanding of what God has done isn't because of what I have done. It's because of what somebody else did on my behalf. And as Christians, there needs to be a constant recognition and remembrance that I stand who I am today because of what Jesus did. The grace of God through the blood of Jesus is what brings transformation to my life. And as the song of 126 says, I come before his presence rejoicing because of what he did. Amen? You stand with me this morning. Heavenly Father, there are aspects of your word that are truth and powerful, sometimes a little confusing to the earthly mind. But you're faithful, and you help us to understand, and for that I'm grateful. I thank you, Lord, for the work of Jesus, for the life that he lived for the suffering that he endured, for the death that he walked through. To bring freedom, victory, and power transformation to our lives. So Lord, I pray may the fullness of his work be accomplished in us that we will walk in this earth as your children and put your attributes on display that others will come to know you too. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.